What's up, guys? It's Nina from Roadie Free Radio. In this clip, Larry talks to Leo Beatty, former roadie for the MC5 and the Stooges. Here he is telling the story of how he got in with those pioneering bands, a testament to the things you can do as a teenager with a car. If you want to hear more from Leo, you can listen to the full episode, number 115, from December 24th, 2018. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Here's Larry and Leo Beatty. <laughs> 65 to like 67 ish you're you're cutting your teeth in detroit doing shows working for shagmore fruit of the loom yeah i'm you're working for fruit of the loom just, you're just thinking i just like this music thing i got a car i can hang out these yep. guys are cool yeah we had a, there was a good club scene in detroit we had crow's nest we had the pumpkin crow's nest east crow's nest west the grandy and there was just this thriving silver bell hideout the hideout there was a thriving scene mm -hmm. in uh, Birmingham Teen Center. So mm -hmm. the Fruit of the Loom I was working for, Mike Quattro was our agent, and uh, we did gigs with the MC5. Mm -hmm. So I got to know Wayne and, and the band by virtue of just those, being at those gigs together. And like I say, he approached me in 68. Uh, I was 17 years old, and it was like, hey, we need a guy. And I just got out of high school, and uh, I was ready to go. What did they? Was, what, what, what were the requirements? What did you have to do? I drove the truck, uh, you know, loaded, uh, you know, load the gear, unload the gear, set up the practice room when we got home. And that was one of my favorite times was being at, at the practice room working on the songs. That was the enjoyable part. The gigs were fun, but I really enjoyed the time in the practice room. Mm seeing him work the mu work on the music <clears throat> but my job yeah the, the the truck i took care of the truck took it in for service uh took the amps in i had a guy in detroit named smitty who was the best marshal technician in the world and when bands came through detroit they would go see smitty to get their marshals worked on mm. um i had accounts at the music stores and i maintained those accounts i made sure they got paid how much did you get paid you remember I can tell you with Alice Cooper, I was getting $50 a week with the MC5. $50 a week? Yeah. $50 yeah. a week in 1971. <laughs> yeah, $50. Well, you figure a Coke, a Coke was probably $0.25, cents, 71 maybe yeah. less. Yeah, it wasn't It wasn't enough. I can tell you that, Larry. It just wasn't enough. <laughs> you know, uh, $50 you know, working for the MC5. Week. Yeah, $50 a week. With the MC5, I had a golf credit card for gas. And a lot of times I got food with that credit card so I could eat. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't there wasn't like there wasn't like a per diem or anything formal along in those lines at the time. Yeah, uh, a lot of brown rice at the house. Um, yeah, we lived in the, we all lived in the commune there at fifteen ten Hill Street, and that was one thing at that point in time. Bands lived together. The road crew was part of the band. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I noticed the Allman Brothers. They said they were the that that denoted that they were brothers, and that included the road crew and everybody that was associated with the band in that house down in, in Georgia. Yeah. And that was the same thing at Hill Street. We had the girls there. They they made the clothes, the roadies. We were all part of that. You know, we were brothers. We would we call each other brother. You know, so it was right. a different different time. So money wasn't um, the prime consideration. Right. It really was about just making it happen. Like you said, these were happenings. Right. And there was, that's what motivated us. And it was nice to get some cash. Sure. But sure. it was, I was young and I didn't need much. You know, I All had. Right. You're 18 years old. Yeah. And you're living in a house with a bunch of dudes and women. Yeah. And drugs. And, and, <laughs> and, yeah, and the drugs are flowing. And, and music and, and women and all that stuff. And you're right. What do you need, you know? Yeah. It, it, as a naive 18-year-old, living his dream. Living his dream, yeah. you know? And, and uh, it was all good at that point. This was also a big time for them in the political stuff, right? Sinclair yeah. and all that stuff going on. What was that like? That was going on. My focus was the music and the political side, the White Panthers and that. I saw the Black Panthers come in the house and visit and, uh, and hear the beating on the table and the arguments, the political arguments. But I wasn't part of that. Mm. And uh, I got it. And I was against the war and all of that. I didn't get drafted. I, I got called up. But um, yeah, how'd you miss I that? wasn't a I came up uh, 334 alphabetically in the. 
in the lottery. Yeah. And I never got called. I had my I had to appear for my physical before I graduated from high school. I went down to Fort Wayne in Detroit, took my physical, and then just waited. And uh, shit, man. And it, it didn't get. Uh, I was fortunate that I didn't get uh, drafted. That's amazing. That's amazing just to think like how many guys did get drafted. All my buddies, they were gone. Wow. They all went. You know, they were over there, and uh, I had no issues with what they did when they came home. I treated them just like they did before they went in the military. You know, it wasn't yeah. like, oh, you guys fought this war, blah blah blah. That's not how it was for me. Those were my my buds. Yeah, and, and thank God uh, they, they came home. Yeah, I was glad to see him, and you know that's just the way it, it was for me. Yeah, but I wasn't a real <clears throat> politically involved, you know, because it took away from the music, mm. and you know the five paid a price. Yeah, for that political involvement, you know, and it cost them dearly when we did the Boston Tea Party gig, and the motherfucker showed up, and then we did the the uh, Fillmore East. And uh, the motherfucker showed up, and at that time, uh, Bill Graham put the word out that these guys were trouble, and uh, it really, really affected the MC5's ability to get in the big rooms mm. and, and tour, mm. you know, and get to that next, proverbial next level. Right. And they were poised, you know, the machinery was in place yeah. to do that, and uh, it really hurt. Yeah. Really hurt them, you know. Yep, yep. And so as the Stooges start to emerge, do you remember those early, were you around for those early-ish days when the Stooges started to, to hang around and everything? And, and I wasn't. They considered the MC5 like big brothers, yeah? Yeah, there was that whole thing. They, they said, you know, the MC5 was like the big brother band. I wasn't there when the signing took place. I came on shortly after and we hung out together. You know, they were friends. Uh, Scotty Ashton, the drummer, was friends with Dennis Thompson. And, you know, we would run over there and hang out with the Stooges, the guys on the road crew. We, You know, one thing, the roadies always had the dope. You know, we always had the weed or the hash. Right. So you're always welcome. You know, I'd go over to the Stooges. Yeah, you know, b he's got the good hash, you know, so hey, come on over. And, uh, you know, that when you weren't on the road, what did you do? You'd practice. You'd get stoned, you know, hang out with your buds. Yep. Read, you know, we'd read comic books or hang out with girls. And we were young guys, you know, right, doing what young right. guys do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we were we were hanging out and, and knew each other. Mm -hmm. And it was there was a mutual respect between the five and the Stooges. You know, they were they were like like minded. Yep. In, in that regard, they were pushing the envelope. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so what what sort of led to you hopping over to the Stooges? It was during the recording of the second album back in the USA. John had gone to prison and John Lando had come in to Detroit to advise and uh, produce that album mm. the back in the USA. And they brought in an accountant and uh, they moved to Hamburg. They left Hill Street and everything was changing. It was going to they were going to set up more of a business operation. But for me, uh, the deal breaker was in the studio. John Landau uh, just treated us as not entities. The, the road crew in that, we didn't have any place in, in what was going on. And, uh, and it, I felt like he'd cut their balls off, you know, mm -hmm. what I was hearing in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I, I can't do this. How, you know? <clears throat> what, what was different prior to that? You know, if you, if, if he felt like or you felt like he thought you didn't have any place in the studio, what was different prior to that? How What would be your role in the studio? More just hanging out and you're just part of it? It was just part of it. Yeah. You know, it was like, okay, what do you need, Wayne? What kind of amp do you need? What do you think I should use, Leo? You know, there was that kind of exchange taking place, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'll go over to Gus Zappi. We'll, we'll try one. We'll try this. We'll try that. We'll see. You know, I saw a new fuzz tone. I saw this wah-wah. We'll see what it, what it does. Mm. You know, those type of things. And when Lando came in, it was really like the door was closed. You guys don't belong in here. Mm. And uh, it was like, okay. I, I didn't feel like he belonged in there, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah. you know, I got this, uh, you know, East Coast, uh, you know, guy with slacks and a, and a, you know, a sport coat. And it's like, what the fuck? Right. You know, right. I'm not, <laughs> what the fuck is this guy doing? Yeah. You know, and I mean, and, and he has achieved 
a high level of success in the industry. It's amazing. Granted. Yeah. 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 But at that point in time, that was my take, sure. you know, and it was like, oh, come on. So I went over to, uh, you know, Scotty Ashton and said, hey, why don't you come and work for us? You know, we're getting we're getting more gigs and. You know, so I moved over to the Stooge Hall and... Uh... Hey, what's happening, roadies? It's Larry here. Just wanted to thank you so much for listening to this short clip. I really hope you got something out of it. If you can take two seconds to head over to iTunes and drop us a review or a comment, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Keep listening. Keep coming back. Stay healthy out there. And remember, no roadies, no rock and roll. <laughs>